Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 19 part 2b GMOs in agriculture. GMOs in agriculture is actually one of the applications of recombinant DNA technology and just in case you don't remember what it does, it is a technology, a technique used to make many copies of a gene or protein. Now of course to find out the full version of how this technology is used, uh, you have to refer to the previous video but this is a really really short version. In recombinant DNA technology, you are basically taking a DNA or mRNA from an organism and then sticking it into a plasmid and then taking that plasmid and sticking it into a bacteria and then you identify which is the modified bacteria and then you take the bacteria which is modified and you grow it again and again in order to make more genes and in order to make more protein from the bacteria using the bacterial transcription and translational machinery. Da. So this is actually used, a very similar method is actually used in agriculture. And this, act, this uh, process is called genetic engineering. So what is genetic engineering? Genetic engineering is actually manu manipulating naturally occurring processes and enzymes which already happen out there but um, instead of using the same species we take genes of one organism which is naturally occurring you know extract it from there and then put it into another organism it could be the same species or different species for example when we are doing recombinant dna technology it's actually also a form of genetic engineering we're taking a gene usually from humans and then we are sticking it into a plasmid using the plasmid as a vector in order to insert it into a completely different organism aka bacteria so that's genetic engineering as well in this case we are doing it to plants and we'll talk about it sh shortly but this is the general idea here Okay, we say that the new hosts have recombinant DNA uh, because it is a DNA from two or more sources, so their own DNA as well as another organism's DNA. And the new host must be able to express the new gene product or protein to be considered a GM organism, genetically modified organism or transgenic organisms. All the same thing. What it means is that this organism has altered DNA or foreign DNA that has been inserted because of us, human beings. So, we do this process in agriculture. And before we go into the processes, we really need to know what is the aim of this. Why do we want to use genetic engineering to produce GMOs? Well, to improve quality and to improve yield to increase yield and the big goal is really actually to solve the world food demand now there are there is actually a food crisis in the world our population keeps increasing but our food we only have so much land to you know plant so um we have a food crisis and there are two sides to this crisis, really. And you can see this in this um, smaller font right here. And you can see that in one part, there is shortage of food. So in some places in the world, poor places that are, may not be, have fertile land, these places may find it difficult to buy food. Food might be very expensive and then the quality of food might not be um, there in order to feed the population. Okay. Think war torn areas, think like desert areas, okay? So there is a problem, and the population is rising, as I said, and the problem will get worse. But on the other hand, think America, think supermarket wasting food because it's spoiled before it's sold, right? There is an incomprehensible amount of food that's wasted every year, okay? So there is two parts, right? One part that's not enough on one side of the world, and on different parts of the world, there's just too much food and it's going to waste. So how do we improve the quality, Okay, improve the lifespan, improve the maybe um, the resistance of crop plants okay, growing in harsh environments? 
how do we increase the yield of crop plants in limited spaces and limit, with limited resources? And if we can solve these questions, we may be able to produce enough food that's affordable for all in the long run. So yeah, that is the main aim here. You can read more about this issue at this link right here that you can see. Okay, I'll link it in the description below. So maybe you're thinking, okay, wait, that was too vague. I need more like examples, specific ones. So here are some of them. Livestock. So animals can be engineered to have higher growth rates or grow faster, grow larger faster, and to have higher milk yield or higher meat yield depending on the livestock right um, we will learn one example which is gm salmon so a lot of salmon is gm yep um, agriculture so we're talking about crop plants here can be engineered to have higher yield better quality or tastes so sweeter or doesn't have a certain texture think of durian okay delayed ripening of fruits uh, this is mainly to increase shelf life. One of the famous examples of this is flavor saver tomatoes. So they, they don't become squishy too quickly. Hate it, Ryan. Anyways, uh, these tomatoes are actually groundbreaking when they first came out. And they are the reason why tomatoes can last quite long now when you buy them in the store. Although they've been like imported or something. Okay. Other than that, uh, you can actually engineer crop plants to have additional nutritional benefits and we're going to learn an example of um, rice later this is called golden rice and it's engineered to have extra vitamin a in them and that's why it's kind of yellow or golden we'll see how it's done later uh, you can also engineer crop plants to resist disease or pests or insects um, in the context of pests if they can resist pests then less pesticides can be used and this will be less harmful to the farmers involved and cost less as well in terms of pesticides used and um, also in addition only the insects that eat that particular plant will be affected by you know the the plants but those insects who are not pests which are beneficial which are pollinators will not die. So yeah, we'll learn about that in detail soon. You can also engineer crop plants to resist herbicides, which again, we will learn it soon. But the idea is to reduce competition from weeds. So you can spray the herbicide. Can you imagine the weeds will die, but your plants will not? Other than that, you can engineer crop plants to grow in adverse conditions, become more tolerant to climate change at as it is already happening. So think of hot, dry, cold climates or high salinity places. Um, we want plants to be able to grow everywhere. Of course, we also want plants to be able to grow in poor quality land and require less fertilizer so it can grow in harsh conditions and in deserted areas as well. Places where soil is not that good. Food can still be grown. Wouldn't that be great? For everyone and solve the world food problem yep 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 so in general this helps plants and livestock right having to farm and whatnot to be more cost effective have more health benefits and in general also have less effect on food chain and pollinators and of course if it has higher yield high growth rate and grow larger you have more money to earn as a farmer Ding. so yeah there's a lot of benefits to gmos in agriculture by the way fun fact about gmos like they are not new 2.7 billion hectares of biotech crops are planted since 1996 and the five most gmo biotech crops are soybean maize um cotton canola and papaya actually and these are widely most of them that you're eating now and buying now and purchasing now are pretty much you know gmo'd so it's not new anymore it's there in the market and you don't even know it <laughs> let's talk about it a little bit more and think about it a little bit 
why can't we just use artificial selection? Why must we use GMOs? Look what have what we have done to increase yield in you know sheep, wool. You know, we have selected the sheep that produce a lot of wool over time, the nicest, finest wool, and now we have sheep that has beautiful wool already. Why not just do that with every other plant? Just use artificial selection to improve the plant and become better. Now, this is why. Use GMOs because it's much faster. Don't forget artificial selection takes years, generations, like decades, maybe even centuries. GMOs also allows the retention of other desirable characteristics of the best varieties of species. When you're selecting for one particular characteristic, you might lose another that is desirable. And we saw this problem um, that artificial selection caused, right? In wind depression because of all the artificial selection. And therefore, some problems in dog species like pugs, remember? So if you use GMOs, that wouldn't happen. And you can even use best genes from other species, which would never happen in artificial selection because you're crossing the plant into plant. But... If I use GMOs, I can take the gene from anywhere. It could be a bacteria, it could be a human being, it could be like an animal, it could be other species of plants that would never cross with this particular plant in order to, you know, improve that particular plant. Uh, but we have to realize that, okay, there are certain drawbacks to using GMOs, obviously. It's complicated, it's really expensive, and it's not always successful. In fact, it almost always fails, only like, 0.00001% probably would succeed, get their product patented, and spread the GMO like plant around the world. So, yeah, it's kind of complicated, but um, we have a world food problem, we need solutions, and GMOs seem to be the answer for now. Yeah. That's a few examples of GMOs in agriculture. And finally, talk about the process. And then, we shall talk, about, talk more about ethics and social implications of using GMOs in food production. Let's start with GM salmon. The GM Atlantic salmon. So, this is also called the AQ Advantage salmon, trademark, patented technology, by the way. And basically, it's just salmon that grows really quickly. Um, it usually grows the market rate in about 16 to 18 months, which is really quick compared to normal salmon. You don't need to remember these details, by the way. It's just there. Uh, what you need to know is this. Um, in GM Atlantic salmon, they actually took genes for a growth hormone regulator from a different species of salmon. And they took another gene for, for promoter from another different species. They sort of put these two genes together, stick it into a plasmid, like such. So you can see here, this is a normal plasmid. You have the origin of replication, you have your bacteria promoter, and this promoter is the one that the bacteria uses in order to transcribe and translate this plasmid. Okay, and you have to mark a gene here like usual, but instead of just the target gene and the restriction slides on both sides, right, we have the fish promoter here. And the fish promoter is here so that, well, this plasmid can be then inserted into the fish. Where's my arrow? And the fish RNA polymerase can then bind to this fish promoter and express this target gene. So this target gene, which by the way, is the growth hormone regulator, can be then expressed in the Atlantic salmon. So this is another example of genetic engineering. As we said, you extracting a gene from a different species, um, promoter as well, putting it into a new host and making sure that gene is actually expressed in the host, which is our G GM Atlantic salmon. So what is the result of this? The benefits are that, you know, it grows really quickly, so there's high yield. It's a consistent yield all year round, so it, you don't need to wait three years, you know, um, you, the first batch will take around a year and a half and then you just grow new ones after that. So almost every year you'll be able to reap results. And you conserve wild fish populations as well because as I don't know if you know but 
the aquatic um, creatures, you know, fish is actually one of the most affected by over exploitation, so overfishing. So if we gr manage to grow fish, um, fast and good fish, then we can avoid overfishing and conserve our fish populations. Now, to add on to that, there's also like a concern that GM Atlantic salmon may, you know, outbreed with wild populations and then transfer this really quick growth hormone regulator to the wild population. And that would cause like certain fish maybe to become a pest to others and outcompete the other species. So this is one of the benefits here. The AQ Advantage salmon is actually designed okay, to be triploid and sterile. So all modified salmon eggs are triploid and sterile. They cannot breed among themselves. They cannot breed with other salmon. So each salmon must be made from the lab and then out to the farm okay it cannot outbreed with other salmon if even if they escape this it will just die alone and be forever alone you know it won't breed and that's good because the gene um, wouldn't be transferred to the wild population and this eliminates impact to the wild population so yeah that's what you need to know for gm and arctic salmon now um this is an animal so salmon, think of livestock like cattle, sheep, um, any like chicken, okay? Think of all livestock. Um, these are animals and genetic modified animals are kind of like difficult. So we're not going to go through them right now, but I'm going to touch a little bit on them in two videos. Today, we're focusing on plants. This is all you need to know about GM and Arctic salmon. Let's go to the next example, which is golden rice, trademarked, patented technology as I said again so golden rice I touched a bit on it just now I said that hey look this rice has vitamin A in it yay uh, but let me tell you the full version of that story so scientists I don't remember their names but scientists realized that there is vitamin A deficiency in developing countries resulting in blindness so it's so severe it resulted in blindness oh my goodness and they also realized in developing countries that they like to eat rice rice is a staple food for them and forms a major part of the diet uh, but the problem with rice is this vitamin A is found in the aluron layer of rice seeds just in case you don't remember what aluron is okay the rice you learn this it's part of a syllabus by the way but in a seed which is rice right there is the embryo I'm going to draw it it is the embryo and then um, which would grow into a new leaf and then there is the starch storage which is the endosperm and this has a lot of starch um, in order to supply energy for respiration to the embryo and on this outside of that is the aluron layer and the aluron layer is actually a protein layer and it is um, in charge of basically pro producing the enzymes needed to break down the starch in the endosperm but it also has vitamin A but the problem is even though these people do eat rice the rice is usually polished and the aluron layer is removed to make it nice and shiny and white so they don't get any vitamin A so this scientist obviously white and doesn't eat rice if not anyways that was just a side point. I didn't say that. So um, they, they, they thought to themselves, why not we make golden rice? We make rice that is engineered to produce large amount of beta curtain, which is a vitamin A precursor. And we want to make them in the endosperm. So instead of the aluron layer having the vitamin A, the, the endosperm can now also have a precursor of vitamin A, which is beta carotene. And when people eat that rice, beta carotene can then be metabolized to produce vitamin A, and this increases vitamin A in the diet and can potentially solve blindness due to vitamin A deficiency. So yeah, okay, the problem is this, um, that sounds very easy, but 
um, plants have this compound here, but they lack all these enzymes right here. Oh, you don't need to memorize these enzymes. They lack all these enzymes right here in order to make beta carotene in the endosperm. So what do you do? You extract it, these enzymes, genes coding for these enzymes from different species and put them into rice. It's the whole idea of genetic modification. So how do you do it? That is the question. So let's go step by step. This process is very important. It comes out in Parsi a lot. Let's go through it, okay? So golden rice. First, first part. First thing to do is to extract genes coding for vitamin A production. So the enzymes we saw this now. And extract those genes coding for them from daffodils or maize. Um, you know, they are a bit like yellow. So they actually have a lot of those genes. A maize usually have more carotene. So maize is preferable here, but either one will do. So daffodils and a bacteria. Pantoa ananatis. The name is not that important. You just need to know it's a bacteria. And yeah. Extract genes from there, and then insert these genes into a TI plasmid. TI plasmid is a special plasmid um, used in a particular bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which we'll talk about later. But okay, it's a special plasmid meant for this particular bacteria. It's called a TI plasmid. Uh, don't forget to insert your genes in there. Don't forget to include a plant promoter and marker genes. Okay, and um, you can use fluorescence, maybe, like gas, or uh, beta galacto galactosidase, okay, or GFP, okay, any of those, right? Um, in the and this involves all the recombinant DNA technology you have just used, right? Like just talked, I just talked about like last video. So this involves efficient enzymes and phenyl ligase, and do all that stuff, and make the recombinant plasmid. Now, just in case you don't remember what I just said about the fish promoter and you can't relate it here, we want the bacteria promoter as well as the plant promoter. The bacteria promoter is to replicate the plasmid many, many times in the bacteria. But you also want to insert a plant promoter in there so that in the plant, when this plasmid is in the plant, this plant promoter can then be used by the plant in order to express this target gene. So, in short, plant promoters are added to ensure new genes are expressed in the rice endosperm. Promoters, don't forget, they also determine where, when, and in what quantity that gene is expressed. This plant promoter makes sure it's expressed in the endosperm. So, okay, design the plasmid. There's a lot of customization you can do there. Then take the special TI plasmid that's recombinant now and put it into the bacteria, which is also special, called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This is a very special bacteria. Naturally occurring, right? It, it is naturally occurring and it naturally infects plant cells by transferring its own DNA. And basically this bacteria is causing the plant disease, usually. But in our case, we use it as a gene vector. We use it to transfer the gene we want into the plant. That's why it's called a vector. So take this plasmid, we put it into the bacteria called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Remember it, Agrobacterium. So agriculture, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. I don't know how to memorize the last part, but very important bacteria again. Only for plants. Only for modifying plants, okay? Not animals nothing else remember this repeat it seven times in your head repeat it now the more you repeat it the more you remember but anyways yeah this instead of letting it cause disease we take the ti plasmid and we put the genes we want and what it does is it takes the tn dna in its ti plasmid which is target dna and transfers it into the host plant and inserts it into the chromosome of the host plant. So in the host plant, it doesn't just stay as a plasmid. The gene you want, together with your plant promoter, is put into the chromosome of the plant cell. And ta-da! The plant cell now has the DNA you want. <laughs> this, is, this insertion is kind of random, by the way. So, um, how do you do that? You take agrobacterium tumefaciens, you mix them with the rice embryos, 
okay all right seeds that are growing um, about to grow some embryos will take up the bacteria the new vitamin A gene will enter embryo cells and by the way embryo is kind of like multicellular right so only some cells will be genetically modified here um, but never mind when it grows to adult plants um, you realize that the gene you check whether the gene is expressed in the endosperm uh, in this case it's kind of obvious if it worked because the rice becomes yellow golden okay and once you check that you can use the seeds to grow more rice and these seeds will have beta carotene in their endosperm and if you grow them they will produce even more seed with beta carotene in endosperm which would then increase the vitamin a in the human's diet and therefore avoid vitamin a deficiency yay so that's how you make golden rice this particular um procedure can be used in other plants as well same idea same mark scheme just change like the might change the plants or might change the target gene same idea okay so that's golden rice sounds great whatever right like whoa you solve a world problem and vitamin a deficiency right simple happy ever the after not so actually golden rice is pretty controversial <laughs> life is complicated gotta deal with it there are advantages to it for example it reduces deficiency disease it has better quality food it's assistance to developing nations it's cheap seed because it's kind of same price as normal no, just a little bit more expensive no big deal right 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 no it has disadvantages it may not grow well in all conditions later on people discover it as other traits are not selected for the normal existing rice are more are more adapted to the current conditions okay maybe due to artificial selection um instead of golden rice um gm seed is kind of hard to obtain as well for farmers in the big countries you can give the seed to the nations but do the seeds reach the farmers and if some farmers want it can they go ask for it how do they ask it how do they get it from like if it's from overseas it's kind of hard and farmers uh, because it's trademark they can't use their own seed technically they have to you know uh, buy it again and again or um, ask for permission in order to grow it again and it's kind of high cost if you want to buy it again and again because um, farmers usually just grow back with the seeds they own but now whatever seeds that produce are belong to the company so how does that work um, does that mean you have to buy GM seeds a year? And if I buy GM seed, new seeds each year, does it mean that I have to hike up the price? And would it mean that it becomes too expensive for people to buy? It's already a developing country. Why are you making it difficult? Ayo. And this is, this is kind of redundant if it's more difficult because the point is to relieve poverty, which is the main issue. The problem is not rice doesn't have vitamin A. The problem is they are poor so they cannot afford good quality food so why not just give them more money or help them grow better food instead of a uh, food with an additional one property maybe access to a more varied diet needed in self chain food maybe instead of vitamin a rice golden rice maybe just ask them to plant more carrots and tomatoes okay what is your problem? So yeah, complicated solution. Kind of controversial. Is it worth the effort? You tell me. Anyways, that is golden rice and its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, they sometimes do ask in past here, by the way. That's why it's on the slide. Anyways, next example. Insect resistant crops. Man, this is kind of my favorite because it's brilliant, honestly. Insect resistant crops that we're gonna learn um, in specific is BT crops. BT crops um, are BT here stands for where is it? Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay, we'll get to that in, in a short while. But BT crops, BT stands for something. Um, usually it's BT cotton or BT maize. Um, and BT cotton 
is then protected against boll weevils, which usually spoil cotton. And BT mains are, with the technology, can be protected against corn borer caterpillars, so you can see here, which spoil the corn and make them non-consumable. They eat the leaves, they borrow the stock, and then in the end, the plant cannot support the years of corn because the plant is so fragile about the holes, the plant falls over. It's just massive destruction. So yeah, insect resistant crops is kind of important. It's kind of needed here. So how does this work? As I said, BT did stand for something. BT is stands stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay, remember this name. And basically, this this particular bacteria has a toxin called BT toxin, which kills insects. So the gene for BT toxin from this bacteria is then inserted into nase or cotton. And as a result, um, the insects who eat the corn or eat the cotton would die. But if the insect does not eat the cotton or does not eat the maize, it will not die. So not the other animals, just the animals that eat and destroy our crops. Basically, the crop is now able to produce its own insecticide, which is BT toxin. And yeah, it produces its own toxins to target against insects. Now, let's talk about the benefits. Oh, sorry. Let's talk about the process. Process, again, is kind of like what we talked about just now. Agrobacterium. Humifacients. Okay. Same ideas. Recommend DNA technology. Take the genes you want. Put them in the plasmid, put them in the agrobacterium tumefaciens, take the agrobacterium tumefaciens bacteria, use them to infect the plant, grow the adult plant, collect the seeds. Those seeds will be GM seeds. Grow them to GM plants. Okay, so same process as just now, just change the genes and change um, the plants involved. Okay, so that's the process. Let's talk about the benefits and the problems with it. Always controversial GM stuff. Benefits of BT crops. Increase yields. Great. Because it only kills specific insects that eat it and not kill beneficial insects. Okay, so it's not affected by pests. And it also does not kill beneficial insects. For example, pollinators. We talked about bees being an important pollinator. This is great for bees. Um, predators of bees as well will not be affected by insecticide. And this conserves biodiversity and the food web around those crops. Less pesticide is used, which means um, this reduces the risk of pesticide affecting other species as well in the same environment. And also less risk of harm to humans, because pesticide can be harmful to humans in some cases, especially in large concentrations. And also, Less pesticide would be on food, the resulting food in, you know, when it reaches you. So yeah, these are great for BT crops. We'll talk about the disadvantages later on. Let's talk about herbicide resistant crops next. So we have done GM Atlantic Salmon, Golden Rice, insecticide resistant crops, and now herbicide resistant crops, in particular glyphosate resistant crops. Glyphosate is a type of herbicide. Okay, it kills weeds. Um, glyphosate is found in Roundup, which is this particular brand of herbicide that is popular in America, I think. And this is very common in tobacco, oil seed rape, and soybean. Um, soybean particular, for soybean, it's kind of a trademark name here. It's called Roundup Ready Soybean. Herbicide resistant soybean. It's genetically modified to be resistant to herbicide containing glyphosate, for example, Roundup. And basically, what glyphosate does is it inhibits enzymes involved in amino acid synthesis. But if you take um, a gene from bacterium Hacrobacterium, okay, and this bacteria has the enzymes coding for the same function, but are not 
affected by glyphosate. So you take the gene from agrobacterium, you put it in a TI plasmid, you put it back into agrobacterium tumefaciens, okay, and then you insert the the gene coding for the enzyme into the crop plant and once you insert it into the crop plant they will not be affected by glyphosate because these enzymes okay glyphosate still inhibits those enzymes involved in acid synthesis but the plants will also have another enzyme that is not affected um, herbicide resistant gene which is this gene coding for other enzymes with the same function and not affected, right? This herbicide resistant gene also acts as a marker gene because how do you know the plant has it? Just spray herbicide, see if it dies. If it dies, it doesn't have it. If it doesn't die, it has it. So, yep. Herbicides will have no effect on the plant, only the weeds. So, you can see here, if you spray herbicide on GM crop and weed, the weed will die. My gym crop will not. Okay, let's talk about advantages first. You can control, you can kill weeds, it reduces competition for your crops and therefore increase yield because more nutrients can be sucked up by your own gym crop. There's less manual weeding needed. Um, you don't need to worry so much. However, there are disadvantages. Again, gym crops, always controversial. Let's talk about environmental ones here. This is a big one. This is a big ethical con ethical and social implications here. All right, so let's talk about environmental. Number one, if herbicides no longer, you know, affect your own crop, when you spray more herbicide to kill, like totally kill all the weeds, so maybe when the food reach, reaches you, there is more herbicide left on the plant itself. And it might be, might be harmful to humans. It shouldn't be, but it can be in maybe high concentrations. Number two, what if this herbicide resistance cross, uh, passes over to wild plants or organic crops? Okay, so cross pollination here would result in more resistant new weeds, more resistant weeds. So weeds that cannot be killed by herbicides anymore aka super weeds and therefore it's going to be annoying super weeds will be selected for by herbicide use the more you use it okay and super weeds are going to spread and out compete other plants in the wild okay and maybe you'll lose some varieties of plants as well and this results in a loss of genetic diversity how about organic crops now, organic crops are supposed to be organic and supposed to be non-GM. So if you cross-pollinate with the organic crop, this may be contamination of the organic crop and therefore might cost the farmer some money. You cannot use that anymore. You cannot call it organic anymore now. That sucks. Now, loss of genetic diversity, so back to wild plant, can cause effect of the rest of the food chain, uh, aka less food or shelter for other species. You can read um, nightmare news okay, that happened in Malaysia um, at the start. This is a news article from 2018. I'll link it in the description box as well. But anyways, the scientists talked about this and talked about it with the farmers and people involved, I suppose, and came up with a solution. Okay, okay, okay. Let's make herbicide resistant crops, but let's make it sterile. Let's use sterile seeds and plants to avoid super weed formation. So it won't cross pollinate now. And this is another problem. There are problems again. Because this makes GM seeds pretty really expensive. Okay, they are expensive to begin with. And then you have to buy it every year. And they, you can't use the own seed. Seeds are sterile, too expensive. And it's difficult for farmers in developing countries to buy. And you know, might reduce efforts to relieve poverty, and underdeveloped countries become even more dependent on other countries to survive. So high cost and like technology and intellectual property may cause all these problems right here. 
And then that cost of herbicide might be a thing as well because you might accidentally maybe or purposely use more herbicide. And if you use more herbicide, then you have more pollution. So you have cost of problems with pollutions. You have the cost of human health problems due to use of more herbicide. And there's also the cost of what I said just now, loss due to contaminated crops of organic farms. So yeah, these are disadvantages specific to herbicide resistant crops. Um, how about in general? How, how about in general? How about, yeah, what, 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 what is it? You know, again, GM production costs is expensive. The technology is complicated. Um, and you, we really got away whether it outweighs benefits or not. It only has like 1% success or way lesser success. Um, and it takes a lot of trial error to get to where we have. Like all these examples we just looked at, they are pretty much miracles. Like it's very, very hard to find stuff that works. And yeah, it's it's just really hard, okay? I can't I can't describe to you like the scientific process in a limited time now. You can ask me yourself. Secondly, we need to talk about monopoly. Like a lot of this research is done by huge biotech companies, which are multinational and what they like to do is they discover it, they pattern it, they trademark it so no one else can copy it except them, no one else can use it as them. And yeah, they might they might be the only ones earning money in the process. Like it's not a free market. People may avoid or refuse to buy GM food. This is a problem. Like in Europe and maybe online you see even Malaysia is starting to be have a little bit of negative like comments and negative feedback and negative like vibes towards GM food um, mainly fear I think due to not understand how GM food works as well um, but mainly because of this okay because GM food is as I said is not that new so it started in 1996 1996 is just like what 25 years from today that's not a very long time we don't know the long-term effect on human health like 50 100 years we don't know the effect and we can't know because we only have planted gm crops for so long so yeah there is a huge question mark there there might be possibly allergic reactions or adverse effects there might be other effects that are unknown now i feel like i have explained this really badly like very simple but quite badly so if you're interested to know about more ethical and social implications about GMOs and food production I recommend you watch this video below this video is by Kurs Kazat it's a YouTube channel they are great animation is great watch it maybe you have a more wholesome understanding of it okay now this is the video this is a closing this is coming to the end of video here and it's kind of late at night and I'm kind of slurring if you can't if you don't realize I'll stop talking now but right before that before you decide against or for GMOs you gotta understand that GMOs takes a very very long time to get to market there is a lot of regulatory sciences a lot of regulatory government bodies and countries which are um, safety measures and like people who really care about you and what you eat and making sure it's safe for everyone so there's a lot of research that goes into that you gotta know your science but you gotta know um, why people say or think GMOs are bad too um, just to understand both sides of the story so I'm not going to lecture you or ask you to choose a side right now, but I just want to, I just want to say you should question and you should think about things and you should definitely research and don't believe everything you see online. Okay. So yeah, if you want to know more, um, I think you can go to this site here, gmoanswers.com and yeah, check, check the resources out. They're pretty cool. They answer things pretty well. And yes, they side with GMO and want to promote GMO, but their answers are pretty honest. 
So yeah, go check them out. And yeah, I'll see you next video. Good night. That's one in it.